name is Tyle Hertzens. I am the editor-in-chief at interfidelity.com, which is a sister site to stereo file, audio stream, analog, planet, shutter mode, and all those kind of things. And uh, I am very pleased, oh, and we do a lot of uh, reporting on personal audio products, headphones, headphone amplifiers, Bluetooth speakers, and all sorts of things that the audio files really don't want in their world. So, I do it. Uh, on the panel today, yeah, I know, yeah. Uh, on the panel today, we have a number of luminaries from the custom in-ear world, and we're going to have a chat with them about, well, what the heck is going on there, and what do you see near-term, far-term? Yeah, turn you down a little. Sorry, Tom. Near-term, far-term. <laughs> what is uh, In the custom IEM world, I'd like to introduce you to <laughs> Brandon Mason of Noble. Uh, they make a variety of uh, custom in ears and, uh, a few, uh, and a few uh, non-custom in ears. Any of you guys not? You all make both custom in ears at this point, don't you? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Uh, so Brandon's with Noble. Uh, uh, I'm blanking on your name again. Dale. Dale Watt. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Just way too kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you, I really have some sort of onset of old age here. But Dale Watt uh, does a lot of crap. Does the custom <laughs> at ALS, right? ALS. Hey, ALS, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Or science. Or science. Who's ALS? Who is that? Ace. All right, well, or science. Is that Jerry's side company? <laughs> yeah. Mike Diaz from Ultimate Ears. Uh, you got and, your name right. What the heck? <laughs> yeah. And uh, Jerry Harvey from Jerry Harvey. And that one is drilled into me twice. So we're going to uh, open this up here and begin to talk about what we see in the future of custom in your world and uh, sort of the near term through uh, longer distance stuff. And so I guess I'm going to open it up. Uh, let's start with Dale. Uh, I think you got my name right. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I normally, I normally thank know you. Thank thing, you. Thank you. Thank you. So Dale, uh, what do you, what, what's what's the what's the challenge that we're at right now, and and uh, how are you currently solving it, and do you see a way to solve it even better in the future? Well, it, you know, just my perspective and my little world is uh, the custom in-ear market is sort of gravitating towards a consumer market. Uh, but there's a huge problem with that. You know, we're all used to doing hundreds uh, of in-ears, not hundreds of thousands of in-ears. And to do that, it's going to take some extremely different technology, mm -hmm. uh, a way of taking an ear impression that's not a, uh, come on in here, that's not like you, we've seen traditionally where we all take the ear impressions with the silicone, put the goop in the ear and, you know, pull them out. Uh, we've been doing digital, you know, been manufacturing digitally for since we started about three years ago. Um, and what do you mean by that, manufacturing digitally? Well, you, you take, you do the impression the same way you normally do, but then you scan it. Um, ultimate ears, I think you guys are doing that now, right? Um, two, uh, doing a UA at 2000, weren't we? Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, but, you know, that's kind of become the normal methodology, uh, taking the impression, scanning it, doing the CAD work, printing it, on and on. Uh, but, you know, you can't really support that at a 100,000 piece a month level worldwide. It's just just not going to scale. It's, it's not, uh, you can't do that. So. Something has to come along that's different. There's a lot of scanners now, the uh, Lantos, and there's another one. Uh, Reshape. Well, do they have a scanner too? Yeah, they're working on a scanner. Well, well they're working on it, they don't like, have one yet. Right? Yeah, I don't they, think any of them really work 100%, though. They, so, <laughs> sorry. So you've used the word scanner a couple of different ways here uh, to clarify. But, but to go back to your to what you're currently doing, so you're currently getting impressions made. We all know about custom in-ears and going to your audiologist and getting goose 
squirted in your ear. And then when they pull the goo out, normally that would be sent back to the factory. Well, now uh, Dale and, and Mike can... Are you doing it, Jerry? Yeah, doing we're doing 3D also. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's kind of the norm now, but... Um, Fran, you? For like... Are you doing laser scan? Do you do laser scans of the impressions? Um, yeah, for our new prestige line, but for uh, like our acrylic and silicon monitors, we don't. No, no. Uh, so, and then Dale, you said you're you're laser printing, or sorry, three D printing the the resultant. Yeah, the shells, uh, not just the skin of the shell, but the, you know we actually because we you know have a hybrid, we have to put the dynamic and the balanced armatures in the shell. That be placed very specifically. Um, you know, the, the phase has to be corrected and all those types of things for different ears and such. And that's done in a CAD work. So when it prints out, you know, the pocket for the speaker, everything's already in there. The valves that we put in them, the threads are already there and the screw threads and it just goes together like magic. Mm -hmm. So. And, and Mike, Mike Diaz from Ultimate Ears, uh, you also are, are doing this uh, now. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've deployed this? Because the, the, the difficulty here is that previously it was a very, very manual process. And as Dale says, you know, going from you know a, a thousand units to a hundred thousand units is very difficult, and, and it has to be done stepwise. Can you tell us how you've deployed this uh, these technologies uh, at the moment? It, as everyone's been saying. The technology has existed, right? The scanners have existed. The level, the resolution is increasing. And what we've done is we actually took the 3D printing in-house. So rather than outsourcing it, which is what, I, what the older standard of doing this was, right? You take a digital scan or you outsource it, you get your shells back. We actually took the 3D printer in-house. We took all the detailing in-house. So we took everyone from our physical shell lab with the same skill set of the old cutting, grinding, waxing, building up. And all of this is done in order to get a better and more accurate fit. You can't just take a raw impression, build a cast, and expect it to be a perfect model for the in-ear. So we took all of the muscle memory, all of the institutional know-how. We transitioned that into the digital world. So it's still handcrafted, but in a digital realm now. We have all, the, all the, the, the source in our lab to do that, which means that we have the source and the capability to receive these files from all over the globe, from our stores in Berlin, from our partners in Tokyo, from our dealers all over. They're able to scan. We're able to in-house address detail and then print right next to us with, you know, again, what used to be outsourced in a full resolution that we've been doing for 18 months and no one in the industry really knew about. I mean, it was that level of precision, uh, you know, pure see-through, no striations, no milky cloud. And it's just allowed us to reduce our fit return rates by over 50%. And so we were very slow and methodical about introducing this to make sure that there no, uh, no issues were being introduced into the field we were tracking and analyzing the data points. Uh, subjectively, it's not what we're talking about, but we've had plenty of positive feedback about the way that they were fitting and the way they were sounding. But objectively speaking, our fit reads reduced by over 50%. And what Dale was saying with all of this is all of these steps are necessary to take it from the next level, right? All of us started from, from being on stage and dealing with musicians. And we, all of us deal with this world of audio files. But the real question of the future is how do we jump to the next level to the general public? And to do that, we have to, we have to be faster, we have to be better, and we, again, from hundreds to hundreds of thousands. Right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to carry on and, and talk about some of these latent scanners if you're here, but, but I want to bring up a, a sort of contentious issue. I'm not one to shy away from angering people. But it's my belief, fundamentally, that a generic, regular in ear that you can get to fit well with a good tip actually provides a more reliable seal than a, a, an acrylic custom in ear um, when you use it because of the movements of the jaw and stuff like that. A rubber tip can move around, but these acrylic bodies can't move around. Um, and so I know when I say that a lot of people go, no way, that can't possibly be. But do you 
guys believe that that is true, that there is a difficulty with hard shell custom in your appliances, that it's, it, it can be quite difficult to have these things to have a reliable seal on all the users. Is that, is that true? I, I don't think that's true, but I think it's based on individual ear geometry. Um, basically, if you, you know, 80% of the people, when you open your mouth, the ear canal is going to expand, so we do open mouth impressions, which means we'll build up around the aperture, we'll build up retention areas to, to make it a snug fit, so when a singer opens their mouth, it doesn't break the seal, but when they close their mouth, it kind of constricts onto the, onto the ear canal. Right. It can be a little tight, though. Yeah, but we make them snug, you know. So right. that can happen, but the other, you know, there's, you know, probably 20% of the of the population that when they open their mouth, it, it goes just the opposite. So oh, it's really right. hard to, unless you have a dynamic scanner, which Lantos has, it has a little balloon, where they inflate the balloon, and you can watch the person open and close their mouth, and you can see the ear canal geometry change, right? That's exactly the direction I want to go with this. Right. So, so carry on. Tell us a little bit about that. So that scanner, I think. As far as what it does, it's a good CNC. It's good for in the canal, but it doesn't do the, the conch and it doesn't do the helix very well, right? So, but you can get that, that data, and they've been using it in the hearing aid world and CICs, and it's, it's dramatically, you know, brought the fit rate, you know, way down. So that's where we need to go with the, with the general consumer. We need to have that kind of dynamic information. But there's been, a, you know, there's been a lot of times where we've had, um, people that we couldn't get a seal with, like the drummer for uh, Lincoln Park. I've been, I mixed those guys for years and never could get the drummer to get a seal. So what we ended up doing was using the 3D stuff. We made a shape and we actually put a generic silicone tip on us, like a semi-custom basically, because the generic tip was actually, had the correct uh, canal geometry to fit in his ear properly. And so that was the only time we ever could get him to seal. And it's probably been, you know, maybe 15 or 20 people over the years that I've had to do that uh, with, but so it's basically on each person's, uh, you know, individual geometry, basically. So the Lantos, is this, this is the one with the balloon on it? Yeah. All right, so so that you folks understand this, there's a, a new device that's being made that it puts a little balloon in your ear, blows up the balloon, a little rod sticks in there, and it laser scans the internal shape of the ear canal, and essentially makes a digital impression. So you don't have to go to the audiologist uh, or uh, who sported in your ears. And what Jerry said was, because this thing is real time, you can open and close your mouth, and it can map the ear changing. And so my question is, is that data about how the ear changes shape as you move your jaw, how are you going to read that data, and how, how do you, you just sort of find the middle point of that? For my application, I'm going to find out, you know, measure where the canal is at its largest diameter, and I'm going to work from there out. That way, when you know, the anytime they move their mouth, it's actually going to constrict onto the earpiece, and the seal won't break. So I'm wondering, Brandon, it seems to me that you guys are, in some ways, and maybe I'm wrong here, but are 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 a lot focused on the audiophile world and the, the designs. Do you do you see yourself following the same track, or are you guys going to be focusing on uh, more the audiophile world and staying there? Where where are you guys going? Well, I mean, I think Noble, um, relative to the other companies that are out there now, is uh, much more like consumer and like audiophile focused. I mean, we do have performing artists that use our products, but it's not something that we advertise, or we don't have a roster on our website, uh, per se. Um, I feel like we're probably going to stay on the path that we're on, as far as like, sticking to audio files and consumers, and also just kind of making really gorgeous pieces and kind of a more boutique setting. Um, but I don't know, you have to, we think about it a lot uh, as far as like, you know, if we want to enter um, the artist space and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as far as like, you know, five or ten years out and this becoming a mass market item, I mean, I certainly think it's possible, but I don't know if that's where our interests lie. You know, it's like becoming like a widely seen item. If, if anybody can answer this one, 
for the consumer, I, I'm just going to assume that it's fundamentally more expensive to get a custom in here than a generic. Uh, it's a lot harder for them to do it too. It's, right. it's, it's a painful process. Yeah, right? it's a long. You got to find an audiologist in your area. You got to right. do impressions. Then you have to send them in. Da, 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 da. Okay. So the so the question is the question is inherently no matter how it gets done, a custom appliance is going to be fundamentally more expensive than a generic one. What is do you think for the for the consumers? What's going to be the driving? And I'm talking about consumers here, not not, not pros. For consumers, what's going to be the driving factor that causes them to go, you know, I, I want a custom. So, so what is it that's going to say, I don't want a generic anymore, I want a custom. So I wouldn't equate cost of generic or custom because the work is actually the same. Unless you're talking about a mass marketed, mass assembled. Right, product. I'm just talking about if a you're talking momentum in here or skull candy. Okay. Just to yeah. Because sure. because in our world, when you talk about generics on customs, right. it, there's a difference there. Right. So a mass assembled retail product, a custom. Actually, there are there are plenty of examples of mass market retail products that are less, or, or sorry, that are actually more expensive than some of the customs. Right. So what it really comes down to, what we've been talking about is 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 more on the supply side of how to scale to build all of these. But what, let's flip that around and really talk about it on the demand side. It comes to distribution, to footprint, and to, to being in the places where people buy. People can't buy if they don't know that they exist. And people can't buy if there is a, too many friction points, too many hurdles in order to get somewhere. So it is mastering the art of logistics, as well as mastering the art of being able to manufacture at a large scale. Those are the hurdles, and that's what the future of this looks like. And I believe that's what we're all well, and, and of course working the, on. The, the consumer, even if they go into the store, they're they're not going to be able to immediately demo the custom in your monitor for themselves because you have to go through this process. And so, what is it from the retailer's perspective, from the seller's perspective? What is it that's going to help uh, uh, increase the value in the mind of the consumer? I think it comes down to getting something that's uniquely yours. Just like people have custom-made suits, custom-made shoes. Does that mean it's for everybody? No. But it, what we're seeing right now is a trend to people being more specific in their purchases, wanting not many things, but fewer things of higher value. That are, that, that I agree with that. Yeah. I, I, I think that's one of the characteristics of millennials, by the way, having three of them myself, four of them myself, uh, that um, they do tend to save up and buy the things that are important to them and they buy quality and then they'll not worry about filling the rest of their lives up with crap. And um, so I think that is a, a true experience. What about comfort? I mean, for me, a regular generic consumer available, you know, I am. Uh, it's quite uncomfortable. I got a I got a pretty bad curve in my left ear in uh, uh, in my ear canal, and there's very 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 few IMs that I find comfortable or can even fit. And um, do you think comfort can be a driving factor in the long run? Can, you, can that be part of the value proposition? I think so because especially with a small canal or a woman, it's almost impossible to get a universal fit to fit in their ear and stay in there. You know, if you're running, you're jogging, you know, by the time it's fallen out of your head, you know, five or ten times, you know, you're looking for a better option. You know, you have beats and everyone that's doing the little ear hook and stuff, but there's nothing that's going to fit like a, a properly fit custom piece that's going to pop in, stay in and not fall out. Sweat proof, I mean, you know, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty much the end all be all if you get a proper fit. And once the customs in and locked in, it's not coming out. Right. You take it out. So. It was interesting that you mentioned about the fact that one of the parts of the owning a custom here is the pride of ownership issue. And of course, Brandon, that's one of your guys' big uh, uh, selling points is that the incredible artwork that the wizard does. Uh, what, what can you say about 
about that being the, one of your strong selling propositions to the world, do you find that, that that's been a good uh, shtick for you guys to having this you know, really beautiful pieces? Yeah, I mean, I think it's worked really well for us. I mean, my partner John, that's how he really made his name for himself starting out was kind of pioneering the use of certain materials, you know, for like aesthetic purposes. Um, I heard that the, there you've got a new one that is part wood, part polymer or something? Uh, so, yeah, so what we're doing now is we have a new um, concept line of uh, in-ear monitors, um, custom in-ears, where instead of like using a traditional uh, medium uh, to make a monitor like acrylic or silicon, which is liquid, and that cures and hardens or takes form. We're starting with things that you can't pour. So we'll take an exotic wood, or we'll take a, um, a wood acrylic combo or a dyed wood. We have an aluminum mesh, we have carbon glass, we have resin casted honeycomb. And so we're milling um, pieces out of these materials. So it's like solid wood, it's not, you know, it's not poured. And so that's actually where we have started to employ some uh, 3D scanning technology and things like that because we obviously need it for those applications. You but can't pour and cure some hardwood. No, so we, nice. can't, we can't pour and cure. No, <laughs> come on now, yeah, we can't do that. But <laughs> petrified wood ground up. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of the CNC, yeah. digital CNC stuff. All the rocks and shells are CNC'd out of acrylic, so you can do lots of different materials that way. Instead of hand pouring and having all the topographical lines, you just you know, take the block, you know, and C and C the thing out. So we've been doing that also. It's kind of the new trend in, in the in-ear stuff. So I've got a little bit of a pet peeve uh, in that uh, typical balanced armature driver uh, in-ear monitors, multi-driver in-ear monitors have impedance curves that go like this. And uh, it's only if you don't know how to manage it. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of devices that people are using number of people in this room will have really good portable headphone amplifiers that have low output impedances, but there's certainly plenty of devices out there, phones and uh, players and whatnot, that uh, don't have very low output impedances, and if you have a relatively high output impedance, and you have a, a, a CIM with balanced armature drivers, they'll have a very low impedance to start with, and that impedance will swing, and the voltage divider of the output impedance Amplifier causes the EQ to change on the headphones. So as you raise the output impedance of the amplifier, the frequency response curve begins to take on the shape of the impedance curve. Okay. So how do you guys deal with that? Do you see yourselves working a little bit harder now that there's so many more mobile devices out there, so many people connected to this stuff to, to control this impedance? curve a little bit better. Maybe in Dale, you, you, you have a, a dynamic driver in yours that probably uh, softens this problem some. But yeah, uh, we don't really have suffer from that as much. So. Yeah. So what do you guys do? Well, most, if you look at the latest design that I've come up with, it's they're all quad drivers. And, you know, and by being able to wire the four components into different series, parallel, series, parallel, I can shift not only the, the impedance curve of like the high frequency driver, where I can actually load down the high frequency. Um, because the thing is, is when you have a, a balanced armature, especially on the high frequencies, as a, the impedance rises, the high frequencies roll off. So what you have to do is actually shift the impedance curve to make it a flatter impedance curve. And that's by using the four components, that's what I've been doing to actually kind of make the, the, the um, impedance curve more linear the phase curve, you know, more coherent, and they get actually a much wider frequency response because that's the only way the headphone amp sees the load is by actually getting that impedance curve shifted down to where it's, instead of looking like a hockey stick, it's a slight rise, you know. So that's what I've been working on for the past two years is actually what you're describing. Brandon, have you, have you thought about this thing? Is this on your guys' radar to control impedance better of balanced armature driver headphones? Yeah, it is. It definitely is. I mean, to be honest with you, um, I'm not really the person within Noble that needs to address this question. It's John. John designs everything. I'm more the business side. But I know it's definitely something that we pay, pay, pay close attention to. And we're also, um, we also have a product where we have, um, basically it's like a, a switch. 
uh, it's a universal product, and uh, on on one side of the switch we have a single balance armature, like the reference configuration, and then on the other side of the switch we have two different armatures, and it's a high impedance configuration. So we're also playing with things that way, like having two configurations in one, and having different impedance values, and, and how we can manage that. So switches. one one setting might be better if you're using a phone, and the other might be better if you're on a higher end. Yeah. Exactly. Like in in that case, that high impedance configuration is rated at uh, 350 ohms per thousand hertz, so it's actually pretty high impedance for that's pretty in here. So like you can use that with a um, like a traditional headphone amplifier or, or an OTLT band. Yeah, exactly. All right. So quick question for all you out in the audience: How many people here are aware of the word hearables or wearables? Put your hands if you've heard of those terms. Okay, so we have quite a few people that haven't heard of hearables. <coughs> and uh, I'll give you a quick rundown on what a hearable is or a wearable is. Basically, it's a pair of headphones that have sensors in it that can measure your heartbeat, body temperature, how much you're sweating. And uh, you can also have sensors in there that are gyros and accelerometers so you can tell where your head's looking. Uh, Apple has been patenting the hell out of these types of stuff for the last four or five years. Um, the Dash 1 or something like that was a recent Indiegogo campaign starter thing that, that uh, uses this biometric information or, or can gather the biometric information from your ears. Many of you may have seen the wearable the little wristbands that monitor movement and then later on you can plug it into your computer or whatever and tell you how many calories you burned off during the day. Uh, so the, there you go. So um, uh, it, the new iPhone uh, 6 has the ability to gather data, biometric data, uh, potentially through the lightning connector, and then uh, use the data from the hearable to uh, monitor activity throughout the day. But there's also, and this is, uh, I'm going to give you one example of use, but there are many, many, or maybe two. So the first one is, is that your phone knows where it is. It knows how it's oriented, and it knows exactly which direction it's pointing and where it is in space after it happens to turn. And if you look at the phone and go, uh, Siri, tell me what that is. And by looking at the phone and the facial recognition of the camera, it will then orient the accelerometers and gyros in the ears, which can't maintain absolute precision on positional but, uh, ability, but as soon as you look at your phone and say, and say Siri or whatever, it can, it can then know exactly where the headphones are when you start, and then when you turn your head to look at something, there's enough resolution of that so it knows exactly where you're looking, and it'll say, oh, that's the shoe store, or that's the train station. Now, first of all, you can imagine yourself in China where you can't read anything, traveling down the street, and you say, where's the railroad station? And the other thing that they can do, since you have head movement in there, is you can start saying the train station is 300 yards in this direction, and the sound will be coming from the direction of where you want to go. So you can turn towards it. Is this? Am I going the right direction? Yes. The train station is over here, and, and you can, it can lead you to the train station without you having to be able to read or understand directions. Now, the application that I love to talk about because I think. So cool. If you can imagine a blind person with an app uh, that's just walking down the street, and at, at a low level, it's saying uh, Mel's Shoe Store, you know, Burger King, and the sound is coming from where it's coming from, approaching Third Avenue or whatever it is. So the point is, is that you could give situational awareness to blind people, where the only opportunity they have to have real situational awareness is to physically go someplace and go, what is this? Um, now, there are many, many applications for this type of thing, but after you think about it for a while, you walk away saying, boy, there's a lot I can do without a visual display at all. Because now you've got a headset in, your computer, can, your phone can communicate to you by voice, it can understand your voice and so give a command. It's like the whole Google Glass thing, except at some point, for a lot of things, you don't even need the visual display. And so this 
this, these are called, these kind of devices are called hearables, and it comes from wearables with these wristbands, but we're talking about head calls. And it's my belief that that's why Apple bought these. Because Apple wants to bring out lots and lots of hearables. They currently, if you say Apple headphones, the only thing you think of is little white earbuds. So how do they break into this bigger world where you have to have larger headphones? You can imagine the future of full-size pair of headphones make a perfect platform for a goggle that comes down. So, uh, uh, and they have all the manufacturing chops and skills and distribution and so on and so forth. So, they, so Apple bought themselves really an ideal uh, platform to develop and deploy hearables quickly on their devices. And the lightning connector on the, on the phones is a major component of this because it allows them to communicate high speed to the phones, which have to be smart at some point. Um, so now the question is, how many of you guys are thinking about hearables in, in, in your work? We've actually got one coming out uh, <coughs> next year. Really? It's called Aris. And uh, it's a wireless Bluetooth in-ear, not unlike the Dash, but uh, I think it's far superior. I've been working on it for three years. Yeah. And, uh, and, and what kind of sensors do you have in it? Accelerometer, microphones for speech uh, to pick that up, and then pass through audio in each ear. And you can, basically you can control your own world. Like if you're in a noisy environment, you still have situational awareness and you can hear what's going on. Uh, the phone can send you stuff through Bluetooth. You can communicate over your phone. There's another feature called Tribe. Who's in your tribe? So basically you can connect with other people that are wearing RS that have the Tribe app on their phone and now you're talking with a full duplex intercom system in, in a noisy environment. Or you're, you're at a, uh, a dinner. You know, how many times you've been at a dinner and you got across the table and you're like, you want to talk to him and you can't. Well, now with Tribe, if he's wearing RS, you just go click, and now you're talking to him, and you don't have to scream at him. No so, biometric sensors, though. No, I I, I uh, felt that the power requirements to put all that in there right now, the uh, the batteries are not there yet. So, um, Dash is uh, great and has a lot of cool stuff in it, but where they're going to fall short is it's not going to have any battery life. Other thoughts, Miguel? Um, not for me. I'm just focused highly on, entirely on, making audio as you know, as best I can, and keeping uh, making it straight through plumbing. So, I'll let Apple and everyone else play in the communication <laughs> world. I'll just play in the audio world. So, I like making my stuff for rock stars and people that want to have the best audio in, in a portable environment. Mike, uh, we're a technology company. It's being part of Logitech. So we have long strategies of research and development, but our main focus, again, is distribution, footprint, making sure that all of these things that we're talking about are able to be purchased. Right. There's another uh, aspect of these hearables <coughs> that you, now you've got four balanced armature drivers, potentially an accelerometer, a perforation sensor, a thermometer, a little gyro. But, you know, that's a lot of stuff to pack in a battery. A lot of stuff to pack in your in your in a thing the size of a, a marble. Uh, one of the advantages, of course, of doing the, a lot of the uh, 3D printing and, and scan and uh, stuff that you guys are doing now, uh, and of course this goes back to Mike, uh, is that um, you have the ability then to build have a shell that is custom on the outside, but on the inside can have all these pockets and stuff like that for all these bits and pieces. Uh, so it's it, one important step towards hearables is this uh, 3D scanning and, and uh, 3D printing of these types of devices because they, they are so small and so irregularly shaped that it's going to be very tricky. But as, as Mike said, Logitech, kind of just leave it at that. RS <laughs> <laughs> does have uh, the the back part of it is removable. It's a it's a silicon boot. Now, of course, you can make a custom fit boot for it. So you just take that off, put put a custom fit boot on it, stick it in your ear. Now you have all this stuff custom fit. Brandon, 
as far as hearables are concerned? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think we're kind of just waiting to see how it plays out on a larger scale with some of these bigger players. I mean, I think that, I mean, in Apple's case, um, you know, they've opened up um, Lightning and uh, Thunderbolt and those uh, those uh, those proprietary those once proprietary like connections and things like that to third parties. And I think that if they do something similar with um, like a hearable or wearable technology, where they have like if they establish a standard, then we can like proceed with actually, right. you know, incorporating that into our products. I'm not sure if we, because we're small relative to a lot of these other guys. I'm not sure if we want to invest the time and the money into trying to establish a standard. Right. And Apple's trying to do it. And right. Microsoft is probably Google and all these other guys. So, yeah. so they've been filing patents, but so have I. There you go. That's good. Uh, so before I leave the subject, um, I, I guess I kind of want to make the point that it's, it's my opinion that in the long run, what we're going to see in the world of headphones is a branching. And uh, one branch is going to be this hearable branch where the audio device in your ear is less and less and less about music and more and more and more about a new type of display for your handheld device. Uh, or even at home. I mean, uh, obviously, this is important at home as well. And then the other branch, which is likely to be smaller, uh, just as the audiophile world is smaller today than the, than the regular consumer electronic world, uh, will be about music. And so, you know, Jerry will forever be able to have a, an audience of, yeah, well, all these guys will forever have this one audience that is uh, pro audio and, and uh, audiophiles and audio enthusiasts, but there will be this other branch that, that in my view, in the long run, is going to be much long, larger, uh, where the headphone is, a, is really a display um, rather than a, a music listening device. All right, so now I'll just open it up. Any of you guys have any other things that you think are, are relevant and interesting to what's, what's going on in the world of custom I am? I just think there was the biggest hurdle is just the impression. So until we get the audio, the the eight ear scanner going, we're not going to have a huge influx of customers that from the consumer market because it's such a such a pain to go get the impressions done. No, what no matter whether we scan the impressions or what, they still have to be shot in the ear. So probably in the next 48 months, we'll probably have a couple good scanners out that we can start breaking into the consumer market then. Heard it's going to be, months ago. well, I've heard it 12, year, 12 <laughs> years ago. It was going to be two years, right? So we'll see when it comes out. But when they nail that, I think that's when the custom side will be, you know, kind of explode a little bit more, make it easier to, to get that ear, ear impression done. And it'll take someone like Apple that wants a custom earpiece to actually push that forward, and maybe we'll all benefit on the backside of that, right? So if the wearables become where they want them to be custom fit, then it'll be really easy to get your ear scanned. I think well, it, so we, there really is no uh, uh, reasonably accurate way to say that this lamppost is going to be out there. So if they can figure out, long time. they're all working hard on it. So you know, yeah, I've seen the first, few different ones. the first one I saw was a football helmet with these cameras that went inside your head, right? So yeah, they've gotten too. better. Yeah, they've gotten <laughs> better than that. So they're close, but like I said, I think they're two years away. It's a, at least. Yeah, I mean, think about the challenge to take pictures behind the bend of your ear canal and everything out front, there are some incredibly smart minds working on this challenge, and it is no small feat. Um, they do dental scans already, but yeah. it's, you yeah. know, it's outside. So it's, it's not, it's you don't have those easier. complex curves and <laughs> yeah. having to get around the, the bend of the ear and then come out and piece all the, the concha and the helix lock and all that together. So. But they're, you know, they'll, they'll get it together eventually. So, yeah. so could there be an easier way? I mean, is, is, it, is it possible that there's a way to go, Daddy Greg, uh, hey, you're sure. here with my iPhone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'd be so nice. Well, you, yeah. think that, you think that's a uh, realm of possibility? Yeah. There's, a, there's a company in New York that does it like a photo scan. Jerry and I were talking about it at lunch. Uh, and they do the... Normal. 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 Yeah. Well, but that's just a superficial photographic look of the shape of this part of the ear. It's not really a custom fit. So, you know, it's 
It's it's actually custom, but it's just custom of the exterior. Yeah, well, a little bit right there. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, I, I think I'll just look into the future. Let's take Apple for instance. Jerry mentioned um, if if Apple wants uh, customs to pro proliferate, um, then who knows? There might be another company out there working on something like this too, <laughs> or something. Um, <laughs> That uh, would allow you to, you know, scan your ear with your phone, done correctly. So, uh, and I will say. So you think it's, oh. you think it's in the realm of possibility? It is quite possible, but like like you said, there's a lot of smart people out there been working on this for a long time yeah. and they ain't got it right. But you know, I always find that uh, the hardest problems are solved by the simplest of answers. One thing that I could share. I, I, I can say this for false but ears is we're not waiting for that piece. We're building out the structures and the processes for when that becomes available. We just incorporate it in everything else. And I, I think, think that's all, the same for everybody. That, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We're, we're building the backside of it for when the Holy Grail shows up, we're ready for it, right? So right. Somebody will be caught flat footed, but I don't think it's anyone up. Not here. No, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we're, we're running parallel ships here, it yeah. looks like. That's it right. does seem that the whole 3D printing, 3D scanning revolution has paid off for you guys in, in terms of what you do. I mean, it really, over the last three or four years, is, is it that you can say this, this well, we, change? We started doing 3D shells in early 2000s at, when, I was, when, I was, when I owned Ultimate Ears. You know, we would just do, the, we'd scan the impressions and outsource it to the SLA printer and bring the shells in and color them or whatever we, we did. But then the resolution started getting off and the fit went off, so then we went back to hand pouring. And then just recently, Yui and our, myself, we kind of, I guess, at the same time. And I know Dale started with, with yeah, SLA. That's how I started. I didn't know any of it. Yeah, you didn't know how to, yeah. Like when yeah. I came into this business, I was like, how the hell you got to do this? Stuff? So what's cool now is you have to So what's cool, yeah. So what's cool now is the CNC stuff, though. Instead of, you know, additive where you're drawing layers of acrylic, now you can take titanium, wood, carbon fiber, whatever, make a block and CNC it out, and it's very, it's more structural, and it looks better. And you know, like the even an acrylic shell is a lot stronger than an SLA shell because it doesn't have the it's topographical like lines. Piece. Yeah, it's because the the shells we do for our Universal Roxanne are CNC'd out of acrylic and. You can, they're strong, a lot stronger than an SLA shell. Okay, well, let's open it up to the audience. Uh, we have more of the most uh, impressive uh, people in the universe when it comes to the things in your ear. What would you like to ask them, Warren? You said yeah, uh, ear, right? <laughs> Jerry, you, you had mentioned that um, you were trying to figure out ways to avoid the pain of taking impressions now. And uh, you guys were talking about 3D scanning. But my, my understanding is you're still talking about solutions where someone would have to visit a location and have that scanning done. Do you guys foresee any way for someone to reliably or consistently do it themselves at home in the future? Not, not the impression material. I mean, you can you do like a semi-custom where you just do the concha, maybe the, I mean, the helix. But, I, you know, the art of taking an impression it's kind of like a recording. The earpiece is only as good as the impression, right? So until there's a high-resolution scanner that can actually follow the dynamics of the ear, the ear shape changing, we'll be relying on the impression for, I think, for at least a few more years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Would, yeah. would that be something that people could do at home? And is well, there a process that you could come up with to do that? Well, I mean, if the, if the scanner is that easy to use, I mean, you'll be able to go to you know your genius bar and have it done or there will be it'll be a lot e more accessible and you know I think it would be 10 years before it would be cheap enough where a person can actually own one on their own you know I don't see that happening in the near future unless you know some big brain decides how to make an iPhone scan an ear you know an ear canal then that'll like you said that would be the, it can be the holy grail I'm, I'm not yeah. doubting yeah. it but I haven't seen it so. <laughs> but that's bits, and, that's bits and bites as far as dealing with the physical world didn't your mom ever tell you not to put stuff in your ears there are <laughs> you know Saturday um, there's a weird company out there called Decibels where they tell you to microwave to neutral oh, yeah. and shut it in there <coughs> oh, yeah. Decibels yeah. Yeah. 
they, they exist. The airplug store actually sends out a kit where you do your own. We we do that too, but we and and actually, some of them are not bad. Yeah, you know, it, it does work on 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 occasion. But if you want it really, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we're, talk, you know, we're talking. We're talking about. I'm just being honest. Here. We're talking about you know. Yeah. Decreasing our fit issues yeah. <laughs> when someone's going into a professional and having an impression done. I don't even want to make an earpiece off of an impression that somebody's done on their own because you know it's going to be back and forth a dozen times. So yeah, you know. depends well, on the use. You've done it. Yeah. What's that? You've done it. You know Joker who writes the IM review. Yeah. He does all his own ear impressions. Did it fit? Yeah. Good. <laughs> we, sh we should actually get him to shoot some other people. <laughs> this is a guy that reviews IEMs for infidelity and head fly and has, has hundreds of, uh, have, has done it hundreds of times to himself. I, I, would, I, can, I can shoot my own impression, yeah, but yeah. I wouldn't trust my impression to be, I wouldn't make my, my own earpiece off my impression, you know. I just wanted to add before I bring up my question, live wires five years ago, six years ago, before they kind of disappeared, was sending out impression kits to customers um, to do their own impressions. And I don't think the results were very good for the majority of people that did their own impressions at home. So a scanner or something at the Genius Bar sounds like a great idea. Uh, my question is, you know, there's that Smith technology that takes uh, HRTS or head-related transfer functions, um, you know, listens with the microphone in your ear to figure out how your ears sound different from his ears or those ears, and then it can go in and adjust or modify the sound uh, so that you get your out-of-head 3D or speaker-like presentation. Do you think that there's a future for that in portable audio with custom IEMs? Yeah, I mean, it's already been done. Um, Darn Fong of Fong Audio um, has, he, he's a big fan of the Smith and he's made, uh, you know, Smith never made like a software version of its, its hardware. You would go buy the Smith Realizer and it's a box and you, you know, you sit in it. Now you can buy software that does exactly what the Realizer does. And you, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very similar. And it, uh -huh. Something like that going to realistically ever be able to run on the phones uh, so that we're portable with that kind of out of head 5.1 surround sound coming out of a custom IEM. Yeah, I think so. And I think like Darn is is doing it. I think that like he's very close to making that happen. So, <laughs> so Darren Fong, uh, for all you guys, Darren Fong Audio, in, what he does is uh, he put mic microphones in his ears or other Years and they sit in front of uh, various very high-end home theater and two-channel and whatever uh, systems, and then plays a variety of test tones and maps the head-related transfer function for the person sitting in the chair uh, to uh, create an algorithm that then modifies the audio so that it mimics what the person is hearing in the chair. And, and so my impression of the Darren Fong audio stuff is that it's actually uh, surprisingly effective. Uh, you have to understand, though, that it's sort of a snapshot of another audio system. And so you get the sound of the guy's Cap Blade speakers with blah -de blah -de blah or 11.1 surround with both cow speakers or something like that. So you're actually recreating uh, somewhat the uh, experience of sitting in front of a particular uh, audio system. So he, on his menu list of, of uh, plugins that you can buy, you get the software and one plugin for a certain price, and then you can buy the other plugins for the other systems that you desire them. Now the downside is that uh, on the Smith Realizer does uh, head tracking. And head tracking is probably the most important thing needed make the experience believable, to suspend your disbelief. And uh, so it's, it, it, the, once you have head tracking and change HRTS based on how your head is moving to a relative sound source, 
your ability to have front localization and uh, uh, get rid of front to back reversals and stuff like that goes up by a factor of 10 if you have head traffic. And that goes back to the hearables thing. As soon as you have an accelerometer in the, in the earpiece, then you could add head tracking, and then you could do DSP changes to the HRTS so that it becomes believable. And maybe most importantly, then even if you don't have the HRTF for yourself, because the Smith Realizer uses your own HRTS and head tracking, which is what makes it the most successful out of head headphone experience I've ever heard. Uh, but once you have the head tracking in there, you may be able to reduce the fidelity of the, or the necessity to have your own HRTS. You could create generic HRTS that without head tracking won't fool you, which is in most cases what, what happens now when you have these generic HRTS. You really don't get the frontal localization, you really don't get out of your head localization. But as soon as you put in that head tracking, it may be enough to fool you. And as soon as you get over the hump, as soon as you suspend, subconsciously suspend disbelief, then as soon as you start believing it, you will believe it more. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, with the binaural recordings, it's always behind me. I have reversal. Right. Kind of stuff. Frontal localization is incredibly difficult. In fact, when they do the studies of people, they put people uh, blindfolded in a room with a sound source, something in the room, somewhere in the room, and they go, go find the sound source. And everybody tilts their head down because if you look at it, it's harder to frontally localize. So they go down like this, and then they shake their head back and forth as they're looking for it. It's called hunting. They usually approach it on a curve from their strong side. But yeah, that's another important reason for hearables. I'll add to that that Headphone X, uh, potentially from DTS, could take input from the accelerometers and do their Headphone X uh, HRTF algorithms for surround sound to include the head tracking. And the trick there is, is your phone fast enough and has, does it have enough processing power to do DSP changes to 11.1 .1 channels of surround in real time at 1644 without any latency? And the answer is probably not in the phone itself. But that's why, that's why you have the lightning connector, and that's why you put the, the, the power up and you put the processing for HRTF stuff in the headphone. So it could be in a box the, like this. Huh? It could be in a box like this. Yeah, it would be a box like that. And nobody and people don't want to do that to their phones. But the point is as soon as you have full size headphones and accelerometer tracking and stuff like that, all of a sudden you actually have a lot more space available to you than you have in the phone. And you can put a lot of processing power up in a pair of headphones. So one of the one of the things that we're likely to see in these hearables is, is pretty powerful processors in the headphones themselves to do all this head tracking and HRTF stuff, and then you just send it a raw audio. Inner monitor would be harder when we're talking about inner monitor. Okay, other questions from the panel? Yeah? Did you ever hear of uh, Wytricity? MIT has broadcast power. Would that uh, solve your problem? Power pump? Small batteries, you could broadcast power. I, I, I did a lot of military stuff for past 12 years and uh, I saw a lot of that it, it um, it's not very efficient and the coil you have to put in the device to you know, pull that power in it's just pretty sizable otherwise it's kind of useless so yeah yeah you could put coils on your body and rob power from it a juice vest yeah it's a juice vest are you worried Yes. You talked about localization and, and all of that. What about the quality of the sound, not just the localization of the sound? Are there new things coming in terms of the quality of the sound? I, I feel that as far as our company, that we're pushing the audio forward as, as, um, as far as we can. Every time we come out with a new earpiece, we've raised the bar a little bit more and learned some new tricks, how to, like I said, make them wider frequency response, phase correct, a few things like that. So. 
I think the audio, everyone up here is trying to push the audio and the look of the pieces and everything else. So just like anything else, it's going to continue to get better over time. Technology will keep pushing forward. Do you see any new driver technologies coming down the road? Yeah, I think we're we're yeah. all working on new, you know, balanced armatures. I think we've got 95% out of what we're going to get out of balanced armatures. So it's time to either push back on the VA manufacturers to to change some stuff or start looking for these other other you know technologies to work with. I saw a lot of sort of giggly, slippery nods on that on that uh, presentation. Do you think yeah, we, we all, give we all work in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, that's good. That's why I didn't understand. What do they do? Sprinkles to give up the world. You guys are working. Good job. Good job. We want to be doing our job. That's what we're doing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The veterans, uh, you know, Skadix experimented and it's still doing electrostatic drivers in the ears. Um, if, if you guys ever thought about trying to do custom molded electrostatics like their SR, uh, I don't know what they're calling it now. It used to be the SR1. Or oh, the little, the little stacks. The disc. little like, stacks that go into the ears. They, yeah, they were really comfortable. Like the, drivers are, they, the drivers are actually pretty big, and you have to, they had to have a headband with really. it. Yeah. But, I mean, I recently just listened to some V-Mode in ears. They have like a 5 millimeter driver or something. They're tiny, and the, there's massive bass coming out. So it seems to me that... Yeah, but how much high end is coming out of it? <laughs> Lots of high end, too. Okay. I just know yours. I'm not talking about. I just heard George Gardas' uh, new uh, inner headphones. It's a dynamic driver, and it sounded pretty good. Sounds I really good. Was, was, to me, it seems like dynamic drivers may be a legitimate answer as balanced armature. I mean, at least you only have to deal with one element, you know, and, and run it full bandwidth. I, hmm. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I think I think that if you look at a, a modern PA system, there's not one big speaker in an arena. Every speaker is made for a different application for a reason. You know, the um, the Stax headphones never had a lot of bass, right? Dynamics do bass a lot better than they do high end. You know, you know. Even the the widest dynamic still going to start rolling off about 8k. So, in a PA system, we have compression drivers for the high frequency. So, I still think that personally that you need multiple components designed to do multiple functions. So, you need bottom end drivers, mid drivers, and high drivers. That's just maybe it's because I'm an old audio guy, but that's just I just don't see one driver yet doing it. Not saying it can't happen in the future, but it's not there yet. It can be really good, but like I said, until I see one big speaker in an arena, left and right, I think I'm going to keep, keep working on multiple components. Okay. Other questions? Frank, you your hand up? No, no. Well, that's it. We're, we're two minutes away okay. uh, from the end of this thing. Thank you, Kyle. Let's see if I can stir up any trouble on the uh, <laughs> Oh, here's one for you guys. Oh, crap. <laughs> it was good. George, hold up, your, hold up the end of your connector right there. Hold up the end of your cable. The, yeah, there. See that? That is a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, a headphone plug, with a 45 degree angle connector on it. And I don't know that any of you guys are. Ours is. Ours is too. Our, yours is too. Yours is too. Yeah, you're still using the same old You have to be able to duct tape it into a belt pack when you perform it. Yeah, it's, it's a different application. And so, only a so 90 degree will do that. May, may, I, may I make a suggestion, though, that a lot of people are putting these things into their phone that make the connectors smaller on these things? So. Our connect, new connectors are pretty small. Your new connectors are small? I, maybe I haven't seen them. I got no. it. Ours has a little step, step on it. Uh, All right, there goes my chance yeah. to beat these guys up. Let's give Next a big up. round of applause to <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.